I have to read it, I'm sorry, my English is bad to just speak through it. My focus of my presentation is early bronze age fabric from Pfeffingen Birkenhausen in Switzerland. The fabric was recovered in the 19th century. Fragments of it can be found in many museums all over the world. The fragment we study is part of the collection of the Prince of Hohenzollern and Siegmaring in Germany. One fragment, fragment has been dated to the early Bronze Age, it means in this case uh, 1200 to 1440 BC. The subject of my presentation reflects on some of my own research biography, which started with working on excavations in Neolithic wetland um, settlements on Lake Constance in the 1990s. Oh, this on the left. Oh, right on the top. Okay. I imagine making it also change here. No, I leave it to that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, inspired by the textiles recovered there, I completed my master's studies with a thesis on the new rigid textiles in Central Europe. During the course of this work, I became acquired for the first time with the variety of textile structures and systematic of the manufacture techniques. I was lucky enough to attend as an observer a number of courses by um, Anne-Marie Salda-Baldinger, be sure to know this book, the author of the groundbreaking 1991 study systematic textile technique at the Etchenotica Seminar at Basel University. Following my master, I was able to examine the early Aryan Age textiles from the princely grave of Liberty Mordorf within the scope of my doctoral studies, which catapulted me from the textiles variety of Neolithic settlement finds into the weaving of the early Iron Age. You see there on the left side, Neolithic right side as textiles from Hochdorf. In contrast to Neolithic textiles made from wooden bus, it was now time to study the remains of the finest wool fabrics and richly patterned tablet used fabrics from a grave context. During my ensuing professional career in the heritage service, I happened to be dealing mainly with textiles from graves. This implies a drastic reduction of the number of textiles manufacturing techniques comparing to those known from the Neolithic wetland settlements. Graves favor the presentation of fabrics. Other textile structures are rather more exceptional. I went back to my roots as it were when planning began in 2013 for the next archaeological state exhibition in Baden-Württemberg with the title 4,000 Years of Pyre <coughs> This is still going on and should be revisited. Really very exciting. Nearby 25 years have passed since finishing my master's thesis, and owing to the experience acquired in this period, my perception of these finds have changed fundamentally. This is particularly true with regards to aspect of manufacturing techniques, the significance of textile traditions, and the respect for the cultural and historical achievements reflected in the textile products of the pile dwellers. All these things are forming a link connection textile production and the social as well as cultural significance during the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. My following remarks will therefore also include a great deal on Neolithic and early Iron Age textiles, without with my comments to the Bronze Age find from Erdenhausen would make little sense. The measure of all things textiles from Neolithic wetland settlements. <coughs> The textiles from prehistoric pile trainings highlight how irreplaceable the use of textiles was in everyday life at that time. The wheels of knowledge and experience, which manifest like a thunderbolt by the early Neolithic, leaves little doubt that considering method of manufacturing materials, this level of attainment is based on experience stretching far back to the hunter-gatherer cultures of the Mesolithic. With regard to textile manufacture, the beginning of weaving and fiber flex frequently and faced a significant 
within the context of the Neolithic Revolution. At this stage of human history, it was, however, textiles made from wood bust and bark vessel that made a significant contribution, enabling the introduction of working process in the area of animal husbandry, agriculture, fishery, domestic activity, storage, and house construction. The base stock includes the products of rope marking, uh, making saw bar vessels, various nets for fishing, as well as catering activities and storage. Remains of coal bowl baskets, fabric, and countless variation twine textiles used for textiles performing <laughs> various functions. The prehistoric pipe dwellings around the Alps, especially in eastern Switzerland, eastern France, Austria, Germany, North Italy, have yielded a corpus of Neolithic and Bronze Age textiles, which attest to a highly developed textile craft. And now to my main point manufacturing textile from the Neolithic to the Iron Age. An examination of pattern fabrics from the Bronze and Iron Age reveals amazing relations with Neolithic textile craft. Nearby any kind of pattern was worked into the fabric during its production. Subsequent decoration of textiles was nearby uncommon. While the manufacturing techniques of ground weave and color pattern are self-evident, Further research is still required into the production techniques of fabric with additional, um, additional pattern threads. That's three examples from Bronze Age and Early Iron Age. In connection with the late Bronze Age finds from the North Italian wetland settlements of Lago di Lieto, where a tapi weave fabric featured an integrated elaborate diamond pattern, Elizabeth Barber posits that the origin of fabrics, which comes from two local techniques, may be traced back to finds from Neolithic settlements in Switzerland. In the meantime, it's being assumed within the discipline of textile ecology that the twine textile, you see one on the left side, from Neolithic lakeside settlements, represents the pre decessors of these fabrics. With other bronze and iron age fabrics, commonly referred to an embroidery it is quickly become, becomes apparent that they are not embroidered. One of the best known um, of these is the early Bronze Age fabric from Irgenhausen, where it's already recognized from Emil Folk 1930 that the elaborate pattern has been created during manufacture. In a complicated process, including the cultivate it, uh, cultivation of flax, the processing of flax fibers, spinning dyeing, the fabric of re the fabric um, was re reconstructed by Hildegard Eagle in close cooperation with professional embroiders. The pattern was recreated using Emil Vogt's template. This reconstruction allowed refuting the most recent interpretation by Antoinette Rast Eicher who identified the find as embroidery. It's definitely no embroidery. A comparison with finds from the Nordic Bronze Age reveals that there too only salvages rather than really embroideries have recorded. It was Marguerite, Ho Marguerite Halt who pointed out in 1980 to the need to distinguish between ornamental embroidery used purely as decoration or ornamental themes. True embroidery, like the poorly decorative sewing stitches on the wicking period fabrics find from Mammon, is nearby unknown from the Neolithic to the early Iron Age in the Europe. In case of the pursued blues from Flintback, purported to be the oldest embroidery of the Nordic Bronze Age, we are dealing with stitches on twines at the border of the fabric similar to twine fabrics of the grey find from Heiligenthal in Lower Saxony, also derived from a selvage. The manner of the attachment remains unclear. The well-preserved fabric remains from Emma, Erfscheid, Wien in Netherlands, considered to be part of a garment of a male or body, are also decorative border reinforcement. The published early Iron Age finds referred to as embroideries are really sumac weaves, where attentional pattern threads have been worked into the fabric during manufacturing. 
This means they are a combination of weaving and warp fabric techniques. In connection with Coptic textiles, this method is known as flying threads. The best example for this textile from two early Iron Age birds' mounds are still the early Celtic prince tomb of Eberding Hochdorf and the Rumigen in Southwest Germany, both yellow textiles which used to be referred to as embroideries. The following might overstretch both the chronological and geographical range a little, but in this regard they exist, exist equally in interest from the Mediterranean area. In his study, Beiträge zur griechischen Kunst, the foremost connoisseur of Greek art, Ernst Buschor, pointed out that Homer did not, did not mention embroidery anywhere, but only, speak, only ever speak of weaving. Friedrich von Lorenz emphasizes that with regard to the description of Greece find, it has been pointed out repeatedly that the pattern of these fabrics have been inwoven and that up to the beginning of the Hellenistic period, the Greece has no word for embroidery. As far as there are detailed fine descriptions of Greek pattern fabric, all they mentioned is a warp knitting technology where pilling threads are manual, manual inwoven. I've collected these finds in my 1998 doctor's thesis. <clears throat> Nothing like textiles on value and pattern hopping. Attempts to demonstrate the significance of archaeological textiles, which refer to the addition of manufacturing techniques, have so far received little attention. In present day, textile manufacturing are imaginary guide value of its significance. It's usually based on the material or on a calculation of the investment of time. It is difficult to prove which other aspects affecting the significance of prehistoric textiles were really relevant. But it is clear that material and investment in time were only two of the factors. Of equal importance was the manner in which the fabrics and pattern were produced. The example of the early Celtic textiles from the principal tomb of Hochdorf allows the observation of an interesting phenomenon. While the production techniques betray the deepness tradition, foreign patterns were really adapted. The realization that the production of pattern in Europe prehistoric textiles occurred predominantly during the creating of the fabric structures clearly sets textiles apart from other classes of materials like ceramic or metal. The surfaces were only decorated in a subsequent state or they can be referred to as carriers of decorations. On the other hand, it is exactly textile that poses the extremely mobile and communicative character in the form of garment and other textiles. Why then were other forms of decorations not chosen instead, like embroidery, which from a practical point of view would have been simpler and significant more time-saving? What are we faced with instead? A category of finds which retrains its very own cultural specific attributes of production, but at the same time acting as a noticeable medium of communication. This demonstrates an inherent significance of its material category. <coughs> there was no such thing as a textile carrier metal that acted only as a medium of decoration which means pattern hopping only under cer certain conditions. The answer to one of the queries posed to the interdisciplinary CNBA Ahara project, research project, question exploring creativity in craft production in middle and late Bronze Age Europe, namely, do decorative motifs move between metal, pattern, and textile? Can such be restricted insofar as the realization of decorative ornaments and textiles was covered by principle which was strongly influenced by traditions of manufacturing techniques. Two minutes. Sorry? Two minutes. Yeah, yeah. one sentence more. Yeah. While well, from the present day point of view, it is predominantly the factor of visual appearance for textiles. 
for priesthood fabrics, the method of manufacture was of equal importance. Thank you very much for your attention.